All right, g'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. Today, continuing on with the draft content, taking a specific look at which teams in the upcoming 2021 AFL draft really, really need to nail the draft. Now, in theory, the draft is equally important for all teams, but when you consider different teams' is premiership cycles, how long they've been rebuilding, and how reasonably stocked they are for young talent on their respective list, there are some teams to me that stand out compared to others as to really, really needing to do well in this particular draft. Now, before I progress, with the video, I would like to acknowledge Daz Talks Footy, who has done this exact video concept on his channel. I've recently discovered his work, so I'll put the link in the description of this video. You should go definitely check out his channel because he's doing some great work in his space, and he's also ultra consistent, uploading very, very regularly as well. So I've liked his work, and I'd like to acknowledge he has done this video first, but I've got a few different talking points and perhaps a couple of different teams to nominate as well. Also, while you're there, guys, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate you subscribing to this channel if you want some more AFL general content but also the draft specifically as well. We're going to be doing some content right up into the draft and probably be doing live streams during the actual draft itself as well. So if you enjoy your footy content, I'd really appreciate it if you consider subscribing to this channel. According to my analytics, roughly only about 50% of you who watch my videos regularly have actually subscribed to the channel. So if it's not too much to ask for, I'd really appreciate it if you hit the red button. Anyway, guys, I've got five teams that need to nail this upcoming draft and I'm going to get straight into it. So the first team I'm going to discuss is the Collingwood Footy Club who hold picks 36, 38, 40, 46, 48, and 58 in this upcoming draft. Now to anyone who has been following the draft to any sort of degree, you're probably already aware that Collingwood have virtually already committed to Nick Dacos as a father-son, regardless of where a bid comes for him, whether it be pick one, pick two, or pick three. Collingwood have stockpiled, you know, a number of second and third rounders, as I suggested there. So what they're hoping for is for a bid to slide to perhaps pick two or pick three, so that they can eventually use the picks they have left over creatively to get some other prospects into the list as well. Before getting into the specific mechanics of how they could do that. Generally speaking, I think Collingwood just really need to continue this little rebuild that they've sort of set themselves up for over the last, you know, 12 months, pretty much since the Trelaw deal. That's kind of when we found out, I think, that uh, Collingwood were going to be rebuilding. They took six picks in last year's draft in Oliver Henry, Finley McRae, Reef McInnes, Caleb Poulter, Liam McMahon, and Bo McCreary. So they had a really, really good look at last year's draft. As a caveat to that, you could sort of argue that probably not the best draft for them to have gone so heavy on because of obviously these two compromised drafts in a row where a lot of kids are missing football. There's a lot more uncertainty with the draft, but either way, it seems on the surface that they have done pretty well with the picks that they had. But either way, it's still far from over this rebuild. They're going to need to continue this transition over the next number of years, and this in particular looms as a really important draft. So like I said, they're going to match a bid for a day cost, which will substantially hurt their draft position, but there's a bit of a suggestion that it might be not until Gold Coast pick three where a bid comes from day cost, which means they could potentially live trade out what is now pick uh, 36. They can trade that into a future pick, match the bid, and then trade back into this year's draft to potentially get another prospect in the top 30 or 35. It's a little bit hard to speculate specifically how they could get that done as there's so many different possible outcomes from that. But what I think Collingwood might look to do is along with Dacos, get another player in that top 30, 35. And for me, that's probably, if it's not a midfielder, probably a key position defender. And there could be some reasonable ones around that 25 to 35 mark, including guys like Rhett Bazo or potentially Alik Alia as well. Paul Fords is also an area of weakness on their young list as well. So perhaps a utility in Jack Williams could appeal to them as well. There's been a bit of suggestion that they're interested in a Darcy Wilmot as well, who's projected to go to sort of top 15 potentially, but even top 25. So either way, I think Collingwood will certainly be on the front foot in this particular draft, trying to get another second round pick into the list. And I think it's time to pretty much invest all they have into the draft. So the earlier and the quicker they could get these kids into the list, the better. If they end up with say a Dacos Bazo, and then perhaps, you know, a later speculative pick in the draft as well, I think that would be a pretty good result. But all in all, a very important draft for Collingwood to get right. Next up, we'll discuss the Hawthorne Footy Club who hold picks 5, 21, and 24. Obviously a team that came out of, you know, a really successful period around 2016 was the last year they were consistently playing finals. They had a crap 2017, then sort of had a bit of a bounce back in 2018 where they finished top four, but since then have sort of meandered slowly towards the bottom of the ladder again. And they're sort of coming to the realization that a genuine rebuild of their list is needed. They've got an aging sort of midfield with guys like Tom 
Mitchell, Jay Gromira, and Liam Shields in particular needing to be replaced over the next three to four years. So the time to recruit a midfielder who's going to be, you know, maybe 22 when those guys retire is well and truly come. So in addition to midfielders generally, they could use maybe a smaller midfielder forward as well. I think they're relatively happy with their key position forward stocks, but perhaps another key back to add to the list as well, in addition to Denver Granger Barras last year, could be a worthy move. I don't think they should do it with their first pick, perhaps in the second round. But again, we're talking about a team here who needs to inject as much youth in as possible. They finally took a high pick last year in Granger Barras, but before that, it had been about a decade, if I'm not mistaken. So good early access to, you know, some of the best youth in the country is exactly what Hawthorne need right now. And they're a proud team who won't want to stay down too long. So it's important for them to get this draft right. Like I said, they hold pick five, which will likely become pick seven. In my opinion, they will probably go for the best available midfielder. Supposedly, they're holding out hope that a Finn Callahan is available. I think unless they trade up into, you know, the top three or four picks, that's probably an unrealistic goal. So failing Callahan, they may go for a Josh Ward type or potentially a Matthew Johnson from Subiaco as well. Like Collingwood, they're another team on the market for a key position defender. And there may be some good ones with uh, pick 21 and pick 24 in that sort of range as well. Rat Bezo and Alika Lira players I mentioned. I don't think Venerun will still be available there at 21, but if he is, that's an absolute bargain. But with 21 and 24, I think they're in a good position as well to add some of those smaller midfield sort of forward types as well with Sam Butler, Zach Taylor, even Judson Clark or Connor McDonald, all around that range. It's a good part of the draft to be on the market for some smaller players. All in all, it's an important draft for Hawthorne to get right. If you believe the speculation, they really wanted to improve their draft position this year to really go all in. Three picks in the top 25 and a top five pick is still a very good hand as well. And it's an important one because potentially it's their last top five pick for a little while. Next, we'll talk about the Geelong Footy Club who have picks 22, 30, 32, 34, and 50. So five picks between 22 and pick 50. I think we all know the narrative with Geelong. They're a very old and aging sort of team who sort of were bundled out listlessly in the finals. Whether or not that's an indication of how well they're going to go next year, I'm not too sure. To be honest, I think they'll probably still be strong. But what can't be denied is they really need to look at a transition period with guys like Joel Selwood, Patrick Dangerfield, Cam Guthrie in particular in that midfield, up forward Tom Hawkins as well. It's a very aging list. And if these guys are not replaced as a club, they're probably going to drop off the face of the earth. So they really need to get the kids in now to facilitate that transition. And one thing that really hasn't helped them is a couple of the younger players in recent times who they've spent reasonably high picks on, in particular Jordan Clark, but also a Charlie Constable as well. Those two players are no longer on the list. And if I'm not mistaken, their last top 10 pick was Nakaya Cockatoo, another player who is no longer on their list. In recent times, they have invested somewhat in the draft. They've taken Cooper Stevens, Sam DeConning, and Max Holmes in the last couple of first and second rounds. But while these kids look like likely types, they're still largely unproven and of course haven't had a whole heap of opportunity. So to be honest, they just need to take best available players. I do think midfielders will be the focus, but also a key position defender. So that's three out of three teams that are probably on the market for a key back. Again, I'm sounding like a broken record here, but at pick 22, they're another team that will be in contention for a Bazo or an Aaliyah or even a Van Ruin if uh, there's some sort of miracle. But I think even just midfielders generally will be the focus for them. They've been linked to an Angus Sheldrick from Western Australia as well, who should be around their range in the 30s. There's also guys like Hugh Jackson or Cooper Murley as well. If they fail to get that key back option at 22, I could even see players like Sam Butler or Zach Taylor doing really, really well in that Geelong system. They're also another team with ruck issues and perhaps drafting an 18 year old won't solve that, but perhaps they could look at Toby Conway in the second and third rounds as well. Chatting to Nightmare on my recent True Footy podcast on this channel, you can go back and watch, but he believes that Geelong arguably have one of the best hands in this draft pool because of obviously the compromised nature of so many kids missing football and the fact that there's a real evenness to this draft. Plenty of picks in the 20s and 30s perhaps isn't quite far off having picks between 10 and 15. So Geelong are in a great position to add to their list and gee, they really need to get it right. The fourth team I really want to discuss here is Richmond and you can see there's a real trend here of teams that have recently been premiership contenders, but they hold picks seven, 15, 26, 27, and 28 in this draft. So five picks in the top 28 and also three in a row. With Richmond, as you all know, they've been the major premiership contender for the last five years. They've arguably been the best team over that five year stretch as well. And as a result, as you'd expect, obviously haven't had the early picks and the same access to young talent in the draft as other clubs. In fact, looking at it, their last top 20 pick was Jack Higgins at 2017, a player who's no longer on their list. And since then they've drafted Riley Collier Dawkins at big 20 and Thompson Dow at 21. So pick seven is a very early pick considering what Richmond has had to draft with over the last
last you know five plus years. Looking at their list, it's an aging midfield and not a particularly strong one anyway, particularly when it comes to clearances and contested possessions. Someone like a Trent Cotchen as well is nearing the end of his career. I guess you could even say Dusty's not that far off retirement, although he does seem like he's probably got a good four or five years left. Again, they're a team that will probably just go best available, I think with a particular focus on the midfield and with pick seven, if they don't try and trade up to get Finn Callahan, I think they might settle with someone like a Ben Hobbs, who is considered the best pure inside mid in the draft. With so many picks in the first couple of rounds, Richmond have a couple of options here. They could either package a couple of picks to move up the draft if they believe there's value there, or if they do keep those picks, they can go for a real blend of talent. There's no reason to suggest that they need to go for five midfielders. I think that would be excessive. So a couple of utilities or a couple of key position players in that mix as well could add some real value. So if they end up taking a Ben Hobbs, who at this current early stage, I think is probably going to be the player that they pick. It means that at pick 15, they're in a position to nab a key position player and someone like a Jacob Van Ruin could be right in the mix at that range. There's a slight chance as well that Jai Amos slides that far, but probably not. But I think if he did, he would certainly be picked up by Richmond. If they take another midfielder or small at 15, maybe they look at a Jack Williams from WA with one of their picks in the late 20s. But if they're looking at midfielders, guys like Angus Sheldrick, like I mentioned, Matthew Roberts, they could be certainly available at those 26 to 28 picks. Even a Blake Howes or a Sam Butler, if he slides that far, could be on the cards for them as well. So obviously Richmond have focused on a particularly draft focused strategy this offseason and as such need to get it right because I'm sure they don't plan on rebuilding anytime soon. They need to make this a quick, smooth transition so they can bounce back next year and keep competing. The fifth and final team that desperately need a good draft in this upcoming draft is my beloved West Coast Eagles who hold picks 10, 29, 35 and 68 and at the risk of being a bit of a tease i'm actually uploading a specific west coast video sometime shortly so keep an eye out for that in terms of i'll go through all the specifics of who i want to pick and all the, the thinking behind that but generally speaking i think it's worth mentioning that west coast again another team that haven't taken a first rounder since 2017 that was jared brander who is no longer on the list the one before that was daniel venables no longer on the list the only first rounder that is still on our list is liam duggan and that was going back a good seven years so it's time for the eagles to really get it right at the pointy end of the draft. Still not an actual top 10 pick, but regardless, still plenty of good talent at that point of the draft. With the Eagles list in the shape of it is, there's still a lot of players sort of in their prime, but it's kind of at the back end of their prime. So I don't expect an immediate drop off from West Coast. I mean, we kind of saw one this year, but I don't think that was because of age. I think that was from a number of other issues. So what I'm saying is, I think they've got a couple of years where they're still in contention, or at least on the outskirts of being in contention. And then after that, a potential steep drop off if they don't nail this draft. With the Tim Kelly trade happening at the end of 2019, I don't think the Eagles have taken a first or second rounder in the last two drafts. We had picks 57 and 62 last year, and I think the year before that, we took Callum Jamison and Ben Johnson really late in the draft as well. Specifically, when you look at the Eagles midfield under 27, and I make 27 the cutoff because that's Dom Sheed, we're looking at players like Sam Petrevsky seaton Luke Edwards, Zane True, who hasn't played a game, Connor West, and Izzy Winder. As such, as far as under 27 midfields go, that's probably going to be the weakest one in the league. So there's a real need to add a blue chip midfielder in my opinion. Other needs include a key position forward with Josh Kennedy signing on for just one more year and potentially a ruck, but preferably I'd rather see us not take a key forward or ruck with pick 12. In fact, you'd have to go back to 2013 with Dom Sheed as the last first round at West Coast spent on a midfielder. The dream pick for me is someone like a Neil Erasmus. It's unclear whether he's going to be available. I've been previously saying I don't think he's going to be available, but reading Callum Toomey's article this morning about, you know, the phantom form guide and stuff like that, they believe Erasmus will become available to the Eagles at pick 12. So either way, just the best available midfielder or even just a player like a Josh Sin or a Wanganine Miller or an Arlo Draper, someone that adds a point of difference to this team is right. But either way, I don't actually care too much who it is as long as we get it right. As I said, guys, I'll go into more detail in the specific West Coast Eagles video that I'll be doing later this week. But thanks so much for watching, guys. As I said earlier in this video, do go check out Dad's Talks Footy for some great footy content. Support him. I think he said he's going for 250 subs by the end of the year. So go check him out. And I'll, uh, as I said, leave the link in the description. So let me know what you thought of this video, guys, in the comments section as well. And if there's another team you think that I've left out. But as always, guys, take care of yourselves. See you in the next video.